Turn everybody in your Bibles to uh, the book of John. The book of John, over in the in the Brit Hanashah. John chapter 7. We're going to go to verse 37, so you can find John chapter 7, verse 37. We're going to go, we're going to get into, the, into this a little bit. Praise God. We're going to find some things today that, uh, that I, I don't believe anybody's seen before. I think this is the revelation that the Holy Spirit just gave to me, and I, 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 I don't, if, they, if it's out there, <laughs> if it's out there, I haven't found it yet, all right? But uh, there's supposedly no new thing underneath the sun. You know, it's always been there, we, it just, but the Hebrew brings this out. And so we're going to get into a little bit that, uh, that just lies underneath the surface that you don't normally think about, all right? So we're going to get into that. So... Um, Let's just read that verse 37 and verse 38 and 39. 37, 38, and 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they believe that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. All right. So, what piece are we talking about? Well, we got to go to uh, verse one to find out what piece we're talking about. But in, in chapter seven, verse one, it says, "And these things Jesus walked in Galilee. After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him." Verse 2, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So this is the last day of tabernacles. So what I'm going to do for a little bit, now last, last Saturday was uh, we celebrated Yeshua's birthday, which was the first day of the Feast of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And we celebrated his birthday, and we actually ate underneath the sukkah. So we had a meal underneath our, uh, a sukkah. Uh, on his birthday, in commemoration of his birthday. Today is the eighth day, the Shemini Atzeret. It's the, Shemini is, uh, is the word for eight, okay? So this is the eighth day, and uh, the this is the day that he would have been circumcised. But yesterday, the Friday, yesterday was the last great day of the feast. Because the Shemini Atzeret is a feast all by itself. It's a separate feast, a separate from tabernacles. It's not part of tabernacles, it's separate from tabernacles. Alright? <clears throat> so, the eighth day is a feast all by itself, and that's very very interesting because it's prophetic all by itself. So, we're going we're to talk just a little bit about that, but tabernacles, in, in, in a prophetic sense, represents our the millennial reign of Christ upon this earth. So tabernacles is when he comes and he rules and reigns in, in, in the world. And that, that's, that's, that's what tabernacles is. So the eighth day, and eight is what? What's the, what does eight mean in, in numerical uh, understanding, biblical, biblical understanding? Everybody just should know this. What's the number eight mean? New beginnings. <clears throat> New beginnings. He was, he was resurrected on the eighth day, right? <clears throat> All right. eight, eight is new beginnings. Eighth, eighth is when you go to a higher level. So, so what does the eighth day represent in prophetic? It, well, if Sukkot represents the thousand year reign of Christ, the eighth day represents the new creation. Oh. <laughs> Say that again. If tabernacles represents, if tabernacles represents the thousand year reign of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ, then the eighth day represents the, the new creation. Over in Revelation 21, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For well, the old heaven, the old earth were passed away. So it's a new so this so the eighth day today represents a brand new return back to creation. It's, it's interesting because the Jewish people 
they start their Torah cycle today. All over again. And that's interesting. Because, and what, what's the first verse in, in, uh, in Genesis 1 1? Better sheep, Babara, Elohim. Right? It is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we return back to the beginning. And guess what happens on the eighth day? We are returning back to the beginning. We're returning back to Eden. We're returning back to the way things were before sin entered into the, the equation. The earth has been destroyed. The the element, it, all the all the planets, all the all the uh, solar systems, every galaxy, everything, and uh, the entire uh, expanse of space has been rolled up in like a garment and has been completely t uh, folded up and, and and done away with. And then God then created new heavens, new atmospheres, new space area, a new planetary, whole, th whole planetary thing, and a brand new earth. Wow. And then you and I come and live on that earth for eternity upon eternity upon eternity. In that brand new world. Thank you, Lord. Isn't that interesting? Glory Alright. Now this is after, this is after the, 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 this is after the uh, uh, thousand year reign of Christ. This, you know, after the thousand year reign of Christ, what we have? Satan's released for a season, right? Satan is ultimately defeated. He's cast into the, the bottomless pit, along with the, uh, all, all the others that are with him. And then, then God then just completely, he takes everybody away from that. We're, we're, up, we're up in heaven. And then, then he just completely destroys everything. Burns it up with fire. There's a baptism of fire. See, the first time the world was baptized with water, with Noah. The second time, it'll be baptized in fire. That's right. All right. That's a whole new sermon. That's a different, whole different sermon. All right. But we're going to talk. So, 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 this is what Sukkot is, is about prophetically. Is all the all the pieces are prophetic. <clears throat> now it's interesting because there are. There are several things that are going on during the Feast of, of, uh, of Tabernacles, the, the Feast of Sukkot. The, uh, during Sukkot, they have uh, a number of things going on. First, first, of, first of one of the things that they do, and this is a tradition that started uh, several years, uh, I don't know, maybe, a, maybe I can't remember exactly how many years it was, but the, a few years before Christ uh, was born, they started this tradition of, of called a water libation ceremony. It's not in Scripture. There's nothing about it in Scripture. But they started this tradition where they would go to the pool of Siloam and they would pull water out of the pool of Siloam and they would then take it up to the altar and on one side of the altar they would have a trough that way they would pour the wine, well, wine down and the other side they would pour the water down. And the water and the wine would, would meet together at the, precisely at the same time, at, at a, at, at, and then it would go down upon the altar. And so you'd have water and wine mixed. Well, wine is, is symbolic of the blood. Uh, they may have even used blood at one time, but uh, you know, they, they, get, they were doing it with wine. All right? So they, and even today, they, they, they do a reenactment. I, I think about two years ago, they did the first reenactment of the water ceremony. Uh, uh, in Jerusalem, first time in two thousand years they actually reenacted it. I think it was about two thousand years, two years ago that they did that. So, so they do this, and every every day what they do is the first day the people circle the altar one time. The second day they circle the altar one time, and, when, and every for six days they circle the altar one time. They do a little they do a little circle dance around the altar. But on the seventh day, on the last great day of the feast, they circle that altar seven times. It sounds like Jericho. Yeah. And it is Jericho. And they are believing that the walls are coming down for separation between them and the, and the world. Where they, the message that, that, that God has given to them to bring to the world because they, they, were, they, were, they were entrusted with the message of bringing, of bringing 
the, uh, the, the message of one true God to the whole world. And so they believe that, 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 that by doing that act, they're, they're bringing that, that message to the world. Isn't that interesting? Alright, so now we come to Yeshua in verse 37. And it's the last great day of the feast. The pre this, is, this is an amazing procession that they do. Now, no, but before I get into this, before I get into Yeshua and, and those things, the, another thing they do there during, during Tabernacles is they they put they put huge these three huge menorahs. I mean these things are massive, all right. And they light them, and the wicks on that is made with the with the discarded clo uh, uh, white cloths of the of the priest. So the the tunics of the priest when they are, when they are worn out and when they get soiled so, so that they you know can't be clean. They make the wicks out of, of, of for those menorahs. So now, 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 think about it for a minute. Uh, this is just so beautiful because this is the season of our joy. This is the season that Yeshua was born. What and and who was? Uh, we we know we know that Mary is related to uh, Elizabeth and Elisheva, right? And El El Elisheva. Is a is from the tribe of what? She's a Cohen. She's a Aaron. She's yeah. She's from the tribe of Aaron. So was her husband. And so, wouldn't it amazing? It's amazing to me. I would think that 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 uh, uh, Zachariah, Zachariah, and his wife Elisheva. I believe that that he would have wanted to have provided the swaddling cloths. She did. <laughs> for Yeshua that he was wrapped in. Because you know what they do? They not only wrap the lambs in the swaddling cloths, they wrap kings in swaddling cloths. And when they said to the shepherds, Behold, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths, they were looking for a king. They were, they, they, they were looking for a king. They came expecting a king. And here he is in the tower of the flock. <laughs> the only place he could have been. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Wrapped in the swine bosses. Skip just did an awesome job teaching about the tower of the flock and how that, that came, came about two, week, two Saturdays ago. And I want to tell you something. The... the, the it must have been just amazing to them to, to be looking at this little baby, seeing him wrapped in a priestly garment that's been discarded by a priest. Oh my goodness, there's a preaching right there. The priesthood is, is being discarded because there's a new priesthood being born. A priest dude after the uh, uh, after the that's a good. priest king. That's, that's good. David. A priest king after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, that's like this oh, good. That's good. <laughs> we, we're just starting, all right. We're just starting with the revelation, all right. So here he is wrapped. At, he's from the time he is born, he is a priest king. Yes. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, priestly garments, but yet he's wrapped like a king. <laughs> so these menorahs are just massive. These things are so big. When they light them, the lights of the temple illuminate every single home in the entire city of Jerusalem. There is no home that, that needs to even light their lights. Because the lights are so bright. In fact, it's so bright that they, that they really don't get much sleep during these seven days. It's very difficult to get sleep. First of all, there's so much activity going on all, all through the day and even into the night. Because it's the nighttime that they do, the, that they do all the, the, the uh, circling around the altar. And that's when they do the altar libations that it is, is in the evening. And so Jerusalem is lit up like like the Fourth of July or better, all right. And it's interesting because it's right then. Now I'm going to get back to verse 37, but before I do, 
There's two other events that happened during this time. Now, okay, chapter 7 is, is, is kind of like an overview of, of, the, of, of what happened, okay? Jesus, uh, uh, his, his brothers come to Jesus and says, you need to go up to the feast. You know, people are looking for you. You need to go up to the feast. He said, you go on up, I won't go. Not yet. He goes up in the middle day of the feast. He goes up there on the fourth day. On Wednesday. No, no, it, 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 the fourth day is just special with, with him, all right? Yes, all right, so he goes up, goes up on the fourth day. And there are some things that happen between the fourth day and the seventh day. They bring to him a woman caught into an act of adultery. We don't read about that until after, after so, so it seems to be like, like this happened afterwards. But listen, the Bible's not written necessarily chronologically. So things are happening that, 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 that are recorded afterwards, but it's, it's happening during this time. So they bring in the woman with that, that's, that's uh, caught in the act of adultery. And you know what he says after, after, after he says, go and sin no more. He says, I, I am the light of the world. During this time also, they come upon a blind man who was born, born blind from birth. And Jesus takes the mud, the spittle, the, the mud that's in the, in the water, and he makes it, he spits into the, into the, to the, to the ground and makes a little, little mud pack, and he puts that upon the, the guy's eyes, and then he goes and says this, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now wait a minute. The priests are going down there to the pool of Shalom every day. And so this, this blind man is being led by the hand, going down to the pool of Shalom. He's stumbling along, and when he gets to the pool of Shalom, he washes his eyes with water, and he comes back seeing. This is the first time he's able to see the beauty of the lights in the temple. And Jesus says this. Let's go to chapter 9. This is just so good. Alright. Verse 1. And Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither. Hath this man sinned, nor his parents. But that the works of God should be manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He's literally comparing himself to the menorah, only instead, instead of the menorah lighting up Jerusalem, he's saying, I'm lighting up the entire world. He's a rabbi. When the rabbi talks, he talks on different levels. He's literally saying to his disciples, you see how bright it is around here? He said, that is, very, it, it is a, like a candle in comparison to the light that I have. He said, I am the light of the world. Yeah. You think Jerusalem is lit up? Wait, wait until wait until wait until wait until I I, I, I light up this world. There will be no sun or moon. The light of God will light the place. That's right. He is, he is that he is that light. He is the he is the original light when God said, Let there be light. Uh, he or he is that original line. All right, so let's uh, so so we're on. Um, so then he spits on the ground and he says, "Go wash in the pool of Salo." Now here's the interesting thing. Now let, let's go and tie this all together. So Jesus is there at the last day of the feast. We're going back to uh, verse 37, the last day of the feast now, and they are they they are they're pouring the water and the wine over the altar and. The people are dancing around there, and they're they're singing they're singing uh, Hosiana, Hosiana, Lord save, Lord save, send salvation, send salvation now, send us Yeshua now. That's what they're saying. Send, send us Yeshua now. Salvation is Yeshua. 
That's His name. And they're saying, send salvation now. They, 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 they are, they've got the palm, palm branches in their hands and they're, they're, they're waving them like, like crazy. By the way, in Revelation, it also talks about that we're, that that, that we're also going to be praising the, the, around the temple with palm branches. Right? Because we're going to be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles up in heaven. Isn't that amazing? You see how it all ties together? You start seeing palm branches and, and you start tying, tying these things together. All right? So, so here they are. They're they're praising. They're, they're, they're it's a loud loud thing. It is it is the most joyous celebration that you've ever been in in your entire life. And I can set, just imagine this newly healed blind man that, that's seeing this for the first time is just really invo involved. And his, his eyes are just you know he, he's taking it all in because he's never seen this before. He's 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 always been in darkness. He's always been in, in it's always been dark for him. And but Jesus heals heals his eyes. And you know they come. They come, the, the the officials come to him and said said you know well uh, who healed you? And he said you know. Uh, <laughs> and Jesus said if if you if you you're a blind. You're the ones that are blind. You're the ones that can't see. You're the ones that even with all this light around you, you you're walking in darkness. Yeah. You need you need to go to the pool of Salom. Oh, we're going to tie this together. You're going to need to go to the pool of Salom and wash your eyes. All right. Now here we go. Here we go now. When he stands up and says this, he says, "At that last great feast, he cried out with a loud voice. He says, if any man is thirsty, let him come." To me and drink. And out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Their minds just went. <laughs> because what he was saying. I am the pool of Siloam. That's exactly what he was saying. And the pool of Siloam. Was the mikvah. That you was were baptized in that you dipped yourself in in order to be ceremonially pure before you could even go up to the temple. And so everybody had to be baptized in the pool of Siloam before they went up into the into the temple. It was a mitva. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah seventeen. Jeremiah seventeen. <clears throat> Verse 13. It says, O Lord, the hope of Israel. I want you to circle that word hope. Because in the Hebrew, that word is not hope at all. It can be translated hope, and that, that, there's nothing wrong with that. All right? And I'll show you why that it can be translated hope in just a moment. But I... I got. I wrote. I got on my computer and I I, I uh, printed this off. The first word in this in the Hebrew text is the word mekba. When you look up hope. When I looked up when I looked up this verse and I looked it up in the Hebrew, the first word is mekba. I got it. It's highlighted right there for me. Mekba. Everybody's well. You know that you can you can take a look at this if you want. Literally, it's expectation, because mitzvah comes from a root word. The root word is hava, hava. I'm sorry, kava, kava, kuf, vav, hey. Kava. Kava is the same word that you find in Isaiah chapter uh, chapter 40, verse 31, that we sang about today in our worship. They that wait upon the Lord. Amen. That's the word kava, wait. <laughs> they that have expectancy upon the Lord. But he is saying here, he said, I am the pool of Salom, I am the mitzvah, I am the expectancy of Israel. 
He's the living water. The Mayim Kaim. The living water. <laughs> the Mayim Kaim. The living water. He said, if you will come to me and drink. He said, out of your belly will flow rivers. Why? Because we are, because we are submerged in him. In Messiah. In Yeshua. We're submerged in Him. When you, you get submerged, when you are baptized in Messiah, when you are baptized in Christ, when you are baptized in Him, and you are submerged in Him. See, baptism is interesting because baptism is, it, 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 we, we do it a little dipping, right? But baptism means literally to be submerged until you take on the characteristics of that which you're submerged in. So, the scripture where it says over in Matthew, says baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. That is not a baptismal formula. The context, everything is about teaching. It says, go ye into all the world and teach and, pre and preach the gospel, teaching man, every man to do whatsoever, you know, we, we commit and baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Then it comes back to teaching again. So whatever baptism is has to do with teaching. So baptism is when you're submerged in the name of the Father. Until you take on the characteristics of the Father. So the Great Commission is for us to submerge you in the teachings about the name of the Father until you become like the Father. Then we're to submerge you in the teachings of the name of the Son. So you know the name of the Son. And that you know all the things about the Son until you begin to take on the characteristics of the Son. Then we, re then we re submerge you in the teaching of the Holy Spirit until you take on the characteristics of the Holy Ghost. Wow, that's good. So it is a great commission that is of discipling the nations. Mm -hmm. And discipling them to where they understand the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. So baptism, so I don't get it, but, but I don't want to get into teaching on baptism, but, but there's more to baptism than, than, than what we've thought in the past, all right? Now, I'm not saying that what we have been taught is necessarily wrong about baptism, I'm just saying there's more to it. We just scratch the surface on what baptism is. We just, we just make it a little right after salvation. Okay, well, everybody, you, know, you have to be baptized because we were following the example of Jesus because he was baptized by, the, by, the, by John in the river. And we're following, the, following the, his, his example because that's what we're supposed to do. And that's fine. But that's not, that, that's only, that's, that's only, a, that's only you, you haven't even, you, you, the, you haven't even got the tip of the iceberg, let alone the what's underneath it yet. <laughs> Being baptized in salvation. Yes. Not just... Because we're saved. We're baptized in the teachings of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In addition, yes. 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 Salvation. It's a it's a it's a lifelong process. Yeah. It's a lifelong process. Okay, so he's he's literally so this is what the, this is what I was telling you that 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 no, that Irishman and everybody, nobody else uh, uh, got was that Jesus was saying. I am the mikvah. I am the expectation of Israel. I am the hope of Israel. And he's your hope. He's our hope. Now here's the interesting thing. The root of that is Kavah. Over in Isaiah 40 verse 31. And we almost, we, almost, we almost always think of that in the wrong sense. We almost always think of that. Well, <clears throat> I'm just waiting on the Lord. You know what Isaiah 40 verse 31 actually talks about? It's, you know what it's saying? I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. It's bound to happen right now. 
I, it's, 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 it, when, when's it going to happen? It's got, it, 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 I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm expecting something to happen today. Amen. Expectancy is the mother of miracles. Amen. You know what? You don't get what you want out of life. You, none of you will ever get what you want out of life. You only get what you expect. You could want to be healed, but if you don't expect to be healed, you'll never be healed. You could want to have prosperity in your home and in your life, but if you don't expect it, it's never going to happen. Amen. Amen. Because if you don't expect it, you'll never have faith enough to even try. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things that we have, are expectant about. It is the evidence of things that are not seen. Expectancy is what you don't see, but you expect it so much it's as if it's already there. What do we, why do we call a woman that's, that has a baby inside of her womb, why do we call her an expected mother? Because she's expecting to be a mother. And she visualizes that child even though she cannot see that child. She can feel the child. She can know the child is growing inside her, but she can't see the child. But yes, she visualizes that child. And she visualizes herself as a mother of that child. And she begins to prepare herself for motherhood. Because she's expecting that child to be delivered in just a few days or a few months or a few weeks. And so she prepares her home for that child. Amen. She prepares her entire life Amen. around the expectancy of that child. Yes. Amen. He is the expectancy of Israel. Yes. He is the hope of Israel. He is the mitzvah of Israel. He's the one that we need to go and wash our eyes with. Thank you. So that we can open up our eyes and see. We need to take him, take the mikvah, take the water of his truth, the water of, of, of his teachings, and, and press it upon our eyes. He is the light of the world. And we're missing the light. Because we are we haven't we're not living. A, baptist, a baptismal life. We're not staying in the water. We're not staying in the moving of the Spirit. We're not staying in the throne room long enough. We're not immersing ourselves in Him. Do you know how you learn a new language? You immerse yourself in it. If, if you can go to a foreign country, you will eventually learn the language because you're immersed in the culture of that language. You're immersed in it all the time. It's constantly, over and over again, the words are coming at you one after another, after another, after another, and before long you start picking them up. That's how you learn the language. It's hard to learn language in the classroom because you're only doing it once a week. How did I, how did I learn so much because I immersed myself in it. Yes, you did. Yes. Yes, you did. We, I still do. My wife, she'll we'll be driving down the road. She goes, what are you thinking about? I go, Hebrew. <laughs> because I immerse myself in it. When I, when I see something, I go, I wonder what the Hebrew word for that is. I'm going to look that up when I get home. I would take, take my Hebrew Bible while they were reading in English. I'm trying to follow along in the Hebrew to see if I recognize any of the words. Because I was trying to immerse myself in the language. How, do we, how are we going to learn about Yeshua if we don't immerse ourselves in Him? How are we going to learn about the Father if we don't immerse ourselves in the love of the Father? How are we going to learn about the Holy Spirit if we don't immerse ourselves in the Holy Ghost? And let His Spirit overwhelm us like a 
prayer shawl in the morning. The first thing, first thing you should do in the morning is get underneath your prayer shawl. I'm speaking to myself too, all right? Is that all right if I preach to myself? My wife, she says, you need to listen to that sermon you just preached. I said, well, believe you me, I was listening to it. Because if you're not, you're going out to the door naked. And no wonder you're having troubles. No wonder you run into difficulties that you can't overcome. No matter, no wonder that you run into fear. No wonder you run into these type, type of things. No wonder you don't have power to overcome. Why? No wonder that you constantly have to, have to cry, cry out to somebody to help me. Because we're not immersed. We're not covered. We're not clothed. He said, tarry in Jerusalem so you be clothed with power from on high. You got to get your clothes on. You got to get immersed in Him, immersed in the Spirit, immersed in that. Until you get so much immersed that the devil can't tell the difference between you and the Father, between you and the Son, or you and the Holy Ghost. He is the mikvah. He is the pool of Siloam. He is the one that we go to. And if we go to Him, and we are immersed in Him, then out of our innermost being will flow the rivers of living water. Rivers of of Mayim Kayim. Mayim Kayim. Rivers of Mayim Kayim. That cool, refreshing water. That cold that refreshes a dry, thirsty land. And you then also will become light of the world. It isn't, it isn't a mistake that John did both of these, water and light, together. Because that's exactly what Yeshua wants us to be. But we can only be that when we're immersed in Him. Because it's His water and it's His light that comes out of us. It's His water. And if you're not immersed in it, you don't have His water. One of these days, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. But if you haven't lived an in Christ life, you're not going to have an in Christ resurrection. There are some people that think that they get saved and that's it. But I'm telling you, it's not just it. That's the beginning of your immersion into Him. But if you're not immersed in Him in an everyday life, then I'm going to tell you something. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You don't even realize that you're in trouble. You're blind and you don't even know it. You need to go again. To the pool of Siloam, to Yeshua, to the Mikvah. And you need to wash your eyes again. Because I want to tell you something. You cannot live like the world and expect to go to heaven. You can't live a life of degradation. You cannot have vocabulary that is not godly and go to heaven. You can't do it. Our job as ministers is not to tell you that you're okay. Our job as ministers is to tell you that there's parts of your life that need attention. My job as a minister is not to make you feel good on, on, on Sabbath morning. My job as a, as a minister is to provoke you unto good works. Is to wake you up. To sound the alarm. To blow the shofar. 
to lift up my voice like a shofar and show the, my people their sins. That's my job. So if I've stepped on some toes today, I'm doing my job. But it's more than just a one-time experience where we get saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and baptized with water. Those days are past. It's a continual walking in the water of His Spirit, the water of His Word, and the water of His love. God the Father is the love. God the Son is the Word. God the Holy Spirit is His Spirit. You want to walk in that water every day of your life. Every day of your life. I'm challenging you here today to go to the Mikvah. To go to Yeshua. To go to the hope of Israel. And expect Him to do great things in your life. Expect Him to do things. Let's all stand. The last great day of the feast. Yibel Raka ka Yahweh be Yishmel Raka. Yair Yahweh Penava Leka be Kaneka. Yisa Yahweh Penava Leka be Asem de Kashalom. The Lord will bless you and He will keep you. The Lord will make His face to shine upon you and He will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift His face. Face upon you, and he will give you peace. Amen.